because uh, I'm about to be joined by the former Prime Minister of uh, the United Kingdom, Tony Blair. Uh, and that's because of his Africa Governance Initiative, uh, the work that he and his initiative has been doing in several countries in Africa, and he has a particular focus now on Egypt. Tony Blair. one here? Please sit here, yes. Uh, we have about 20 minutes, so please do use that address again. Um, if there's anything on your mind, which I should put to Mr. Blair, um, and we're going to get straight down to business. We haven't met before in the green room, so uh, Mr. Blair, nice to see you here rather than in London. Thanks, Nick. Um, I'd like to ask you about the kind of message you leave when you come here in your informal meeting. You have been involved in many transformations, not least uh, when you were prime minister. But what you're seeing around Africa at the moment, this is now an enormous country of 90 million, which is moving in a different direction. What kind of advice uh, and insight are you giving, given that there is this public expectation of significant change? And as you know, as a politician, it's very difficult to deliver in the time that the public expects. Thanks, Nick, and um, thank you very much, everyone, for, for uh, listening to me. It's a great pleasure to be here with you. And the first thing I'd like to say is that I think the holding of this conference, uh, the way it's been organized, the way it's been positioned, and the people that have come is a huge sign of confidence and optimism about the Egypt of the future. And I am personally um, honored to be here. Um, so here's, look, I always say to people, government is a tough business. And the most difficult thing about government is taking the great idea and turning it into reality. And I will say to, to, we work in Africa, we work in about another eight or 10 countries around the world, so whenever I'm talking to new presidents or new prime ministers, I say to them, when I first came to Downing Street, I thought I was prime minister, sitting in the cabinet room, if I took a decision that something should be done, then something would be done. This was a big mistake. Right. <laughs> Taking the decision that something should be done is the start. Right. You've then got to do it. And that's a whole other thing. There are interests that get in the way. There's bureaucracy that gets in the way. There's old fashioned practices that get in the way. So you've got to overcome all of that. Now, for me, I think with Egypt, what is exciting and what is possible is the following. Short term, I think the government's taking some good decisions, you know, around the new investment law. They're taking some of the difficult reforms over fuel subsidies. Um, the very fact that they're encouraging the private sector is excellent. This is why their growth rates are going up. This is why their deficit's coming down and so on. That's in the short term. And I think everything's got to be done to encourage the right climate for business investment. But then secondly, I think you've got the longer term things as well. How do you educate your workforce for the 21st century? You know, education's absolutely vital. How do you define the workforce though now? <coughs> How do you, I'll say it again because the microphone wasn't open. How do you define the future workforce? Is it jobs? Is it work? Is it skills? There is this enormous bulge in Africa which you are tracking right. in the AGI. Uh, and here in this country, two-thirds is under 30. Right. So the essence is, it's not any education. It's what I call education for the modern world. And here's where the politics and the economics come together. And let me just say two things very clearly. If you want a workforce of the future, you've got to educate your young people to an open-minded and tolerant view of those that are different. You know, that's why any education that teaches people that those, say, of a different faith or a different culture are alien, that's not an education for the 21st century. An education for the 21st century <laughs> is one that celebrates diversity and tolerance. The second thing, to put it very bluntly, is this. We need to make sure that women become a major part of the workforce. And, you know, 
There's no successful economy today that I can think of in which there isn't at least an attempt not just to get more women into the workforce, but more women in senior positions. So in my view, in that long-term side, the education reforms are going to be very important here. So you've got the short-term and the long-term. Of course, the UNDP was warning about that in 2003, we're 12 years on, about women in the workforce and them being a significant resource. And here you are saying it again. Let me pick up some of the questions, if I may. This from uh, Vernon Soiree, I hope I pronounced it correctly. What needs to be done now to convince young Africans they have a bright future wi within the continent, rather than thinking they have to leave to prosper. And here we are, uh, not far from the Mediterranean coast and the struggle of the Italians. The Italian Prime Minister Renzo was, Renzi was here yesterday. I mean, in my view, aid is important, but the key is governance. You know, here's, here's the thing that really interests me about the world today. We have now decades of experience of the process of government in the developed world and in the developing world. And the thing that's most interesting is this. What government should do, what they should do, I think is pretty easy to, to learn. The hard thing is doing it. So for, for African countries, if you want your economy to prosper, make sure that you have predictable rules for doing business, you have a climate that encourages investment, People, when they come in and try and invest in the country, know that their legal contracts are going to be adhered to. Understand the importance of infrastructure and make sure that you're squeezing out the corruption and the lack of transparency which gets in the way of doing proper business. You follow those rules, there is a lot of capital out there and people looking to invest. So I think the, the reason I work on the issue of governance is that in my view today, the big challenge for government is not just honesty and lack of corruption and so on. It's also efficacy. How do you get things done? And I think infrastructure, particularly electricity, is vital. Developing your resources in a proper way is vital. And making sure that when business is doing business in your country, they're properly looked after, they know the rules are predictable, and those rules are actually kept to. Mr. Blair, what about the the business of governance, though, and those at the top. You are, have been dealing around Africa with some countries where there is democracy minus, and here the election has been delayed. What is your overarching view now, you're not a serving politician anymore, um, about the business of how much democracy can get in the way of reform, and how much a certain degree of direction from the top is actually vital to set in, in place what is needed for reform? Look, I'm absolutely in favor of democracy and, and I think that in the end, all countries will, as they, as they develop, they will go to a situation where the citizens elect the government. But I also think you've got to be realistic sometimes about the path of development. And sometimes you will have a country that is not what we would call 100% Western style type of democracy, but on the other hand is going in a direction of development that's really important. And so for me, the single most important thing for African countries right now, yes, of course they should be democratic, but they've got to be able to take those key core decisions in government around those items I've, I've just mentioned that allow the country to function. Because otherwise what happens is, you know, look at the resources in African countries. Look at the resources that Egypt has. Without the reforms, you know, the economic reforms, the infrastructure, the development of the economy in the right way, you're never going to be able to exploit that potential. So yes, democracy is important, but democracy is not on its own sufficient. You also need efficacy. You need effective government taking effective decisions. And one of the reasons why I think for Egypt now, with President Sisi, I think for the first time, and you know, I've some experience at least of Egypt over the last couple of decades. For the first time in my memory, you have a leadership in Egypt that understands the modern world, is prepared to take the measures that are relevant for the modern world, and wants Egypt connected to the modern world in the right way. And that is a fantastic opportunity. You use 
You've just used three important words, modern world and connectivity. This country is becoming much more connected. We're going to have a big ICT sectoral discussion this afternoon. Uh, when you look at the reality, you've just been in Rwanda, which is one of the most connected countries in the world, and you see the empowerment and the expectations of the public. How much do you see this now as a constraint on political leadership, given that the public expects much more, much quicker, but if it doesn't get what it wants, it starts creating these new ad hoc communities of empowerment? Yeah, that's a problem. <laughs> Look, one of the things that is the most difficult about government today is the expectations of the people will always run far ahead of what any government, no matter the most brilliant, can, can deliver. But how do you manage that? You, you've got to manage it by describing a journey and by taking the people of the country on, on that journey where they may want to go faster, but at least if they know this is where we're going and they can see that you are taking steps to get there, in my view, ultimately, they understand that it's going to take time. But, you know, I remember when I was in Downing Street and I'd been there for three months. You didn't have Twitter in those days. No, exactly. It's even worse today uh, is the point I'm about to make. But I remember getting a letter from someone after three months in Downing Street saying, Mr. Blair, you promised at the election you would transform the National Health Service. You've now been in power for a long time. Where is the transformation? And I'm kind of sitting there thinking, oh, we had three months. But, you know, for people today, especially with social media, when social media multiplies the impact of conventional media, then there is a vast amount of expectation. The only way you can deal with it is to be direct and honest and say it's going to take time, but we are going in this direction. There is the house on the hill. We're getting there. But you're going to have to be patient and you're going to have to understand some of these changes take a long time to work. I'm not going back to 2011, but even if you and I were sitting in Whitehall or somewhere close to Whitehall, we'd be hearing from the British government about the, the real pressures on this. What, what do you see as the way to manage it? Is it to go out all the time communicating uh, to say, look, we've got this problem, understand the way we're going? Or is it to be more authoritarian, dare I say dictatorial, and say that's the way it's going to be? I don't think you have to be authoritarian, but you have to be direct. And he, here's, here's one of the paradoxes of the way politics works today. You know, we live because of social media. In a sense, you live in the kind of era of the loudmouth, right? Everyone's got a voice. And the people that go out there fastest and hardest, you know, they, they have now the ability to run their statements and get them replayed everywhere. Okay, so on the one hand, you have far more pressure on politicians and political leaders. The paradox is this, though. At the same time, the public as a whole, in my view, are more sensible. And they do understand that leaders have to lead. And this is what I think is really important. Uh, a street protest is not a policy. Okay? A trend on Twitter is not a government, right? And at some point, I think people respond to a leader saying, the job of leadership is to say no as well as yes, this is where I'm going, and this is what we're going to do. And I think people get confidence from that. I think where they get an anxious about leaders is where they think, whichever way the wind's blowing, these guys are gonna get blown with it. That's not leadership, that's followership, and it's not a very good idea in politics. You're dealing in so many different countries at the moment, and a lot of them in Africa, you can see them on the website. But let me quote to you um, something which is clear in the principles you're pushing when it comes to African governance, which is presumably the same as governance everywhere. Get the basic things right, and many of the complex challenges get a whole lot easier. Get them wrong, and they become next to impossible. What is the challenge and dilemma, therefore, for Egypt? Um, prioritization. W w when you've got a situation where, you know, anyone can come and write you a report, say, this is what Egypt should look like in 2030. And, you know, you guys have just been discussing 2030. And I've even come across reports for countries that say, this is our vision 2050. It's 
quite a long way ahead. The really hard thing about government is, okay, what's the next two years look like? Where do you start? You've got all these problems. What's the first thing you do? And what I try and do in the presidents I work with the prime ministers is to say, okay, we can't do everything. What are the first five or six top priorities? Now, as I say, in Egypt, some of those measures are getting taken around investment laws and subsidies and so on. But then, what are the other things? What are the key things on infrastructure you've got to do immediately, or at least put in train to be done? And that prioritization, you know, it's what I call the three Ps. Prioritization, policy to match the priorities, performance management of delivery. And, you know, getting prioritization, by the way, is tough. People always talk about it as if it's easy. It's not. It's really tough. But it, it means that the government has a focus right from the beginning of what is important. And then that allows you, because no government can work on one term, in my view. You know, if you want to change a country, you've got to have the time to do it. And therefore, you need to start with your priorities. You need to take people on that journey. And then hopefully, after your first term, you're able to say to people, I know I've got a lot to do, but here's what I've already done, so give me the chance to finish it. Let me ask you one more final question. Um, you don't have to deal with civil servants anymore. We've just had a very, very vibrant conversation up here about how the civil service, public service works here. And we had uh, uh, Mr. Sawiris saying, you know, in the end, that's a big problem because they are obstructing. We had a minister saying we're doing incredibly well, even though uh, it's taken seven months. Now you don't have to answer for the, for the British civil service in public. What's your advice about how public servants, public service, which is naturally very resistant, very conservative, looking after itself, could really be encouraged to change, to understand there's a new way of doing things and it's a priority for the country? Um, well, you know, there's a, that famous British TV program that you and I will both know, which is Yes, Prime Minister. Which you I explain what that is to uh, which, which, which is Which is about a, a senior civil servant and, and a, a British Prime Minister. And, and basically, it's supposed to be a comedy, and I always say it's a documentary. Um, <laughs> Did you recognize yourself? <laughs> I absolutely recognize myself in it. Uh, that's right. You know, starting from the thing that worries you most when you're Prime Minister is when, you, when your civil servants say, Prime Minister, that's an immensely courageous decision. And then you think, oh my God, I'm getting something wrong here. Can we so, translate this to Egyptian culture? Um, I think probably bureaucracy is universal. But how do you change it? You change it in this way. First of all, by the way, I think bureaucracies can be too large and need to be smaller and more strategic. But secondly, you need, if necessary, to bring in people from the outside and you need to give those civil servants, because there are some, and I found them in government, who themselves want to be agents of change, to say, you can also help. But you've got to give strong leadership, and you can't let the system end up managing you. You have got to end up managing the system. Do you believe, <laughs> but again, because it's what the investors are saying, what we heard from Mr. Sawiris and others, do you believe that the mindsets of those who've been in positions of public service can change at the speed that is necessary for reform? Uh, in some cases, and that's what why you've to got to choose. What you've got to choose your people carefully, and I certainly found it... From inside it, or outside? Both. So I think I found it very helpful. In my second term, I started to bring a lot of people in from the outside. And if you get the right people, um, they will then start to form partnerships with some of the public servants. You know, public servants, you know, they also can be the systems, but they need that strong direction, and they need to realize that they can't just wait you out. You know, that if they stay there long enough, you'll disappear. I mean, you will disappear at some point, but I think it is possible um, to make a modern bureaucracy work properly, but don't leave the system as it is, because if you do, um, you will find it very hard to make the changes. Can it necessary. drag down reform if it isn't changed and yes. they aren't encouraged? Yes. So one major part of reform is to reform the way government works. And, and here's the problem. In the private sector, 
if you don't reform and change in a changing world, you go out of business. Public sector, <laughs> not like that. <laughs> if you don't change and reform, you're still there. <laughs> Unchanged and unreformed. So what is absolutely necessary is as part of the reform process, reform government itself. If the rest of the world is changing around you, government also has to change. Final question. There were a lot of remarks from senior politicians from around the world who are standing on this platform, over 30 of them yesterday, talking about the need for a new economic security and the word terrorism and violence were used. Can that be achieved, economic security as a counterweight to the kind of horrors which were listed by several leaders here yesterday? Yeah, of course. And, and by the way, the reason why so many people have come to Egypt yesterday and today and tomorrow, the reason why is because I think people have woken up to the fact that the future of Egypt is also the future of Europe and the West. It's the future of the rest of the world. And um, the reason why it's so important, to, whatever criticisms people have, the reason why it is so important to back the president and Egypt at this time is that if Egypt stands for an open-minded, connected, sensible, tolerant view of the world, that will have as big an impact as all the rest of the security measures in defeating those that would close our world down and giving opportunity to the large numbers of young people who need it. That phrase, economic, <laughs> economic security, a new form of security. Absolutely right, absolutely correct, and it will depend on the government, but also the goodwill of the people here. Tony Blair, thank you very much indeed for thank sharing you. your thoughts. <laughs>